and these are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to April's Torah Alive webinar with Rabbi Rich Kirshen and myself, Rabbi Joan Glazer Farber. We will begin our webinar formally in the next couple minutes, giving people time to log on. Thank you for your patience. Just going to wait another minute or so to give people time to log on, and then we will begin. Okay, I think we should begin. Let me welcome you again. This is Joan Blazer Farber, Adult Learning Specialist for the URJ. With us today is Rabbi Rich Kirshen of the Salt International Education Center of the World Union for Progressive Judaism. And this is our first attempt to do a webinar with Rich sitting in Jerusalem and I'm sitting in New York. While we have been international, since I know we have some Canadians on the call, this is our really time zone challenge webinar. Um, and I'm glad you all are here. We will begin with Ashley Copeland talking us through some of the technical parts of the webinar. Hello again, everyone. My name is Ashley, and I'm just going to go over a few slides before we begin our presentation. I think some of you are actually repeat webinar viewers, so bear with me for just a moment. Uh, right now you are in listen-only mode, just to reiterate that we cannot hear you unless you are unmuted, but you should be able to hear the presentation without a hitch. And uh, so right now we're just going to go over the webinar panel. So going to the next slide. Uh, when it appears on your screen, here we go, you should see a picture that looks like your webinar panel. And if you'd like to minimize your webinar panel, you can do so by clicking on the double arrow icon. And below that, you will see a hand with a little arrow underneath it, and that is the raise hand icon. And if you'd like to raise your hand so that we can call on you and unmute you, and so we can actually have a dialogue during this presentation, you can raise your hand by pressing on that. And below that, you will see the questions log. 
And the questions log is what you can use in order to type a question into us if you're unable to be unmuted or if you would like to just type a question during the presentation and it's not yet time to pause for questions and answers. Uh, also, if you have any technical issues, this is a good way to reach me and I will be here throughout the presentation in order to answer any technical issues or to try to assist in answering questions. Next slide. Uh, now to go over the audio controls briefly. If you do have a microphone on your computer, you can use microphone and speakers. Otherwise, if you do not have a microphone, it is best to use your telephone. And please note that you must enter the access code as well as the audio pin. And the audio pin is a two or three digit code that is in the middle of two pound signs. So in order to enter it properly, you have to press pound the two or three digit number and then pound one more time. Next slide. So if you do need any additional assistance, GoToWebinar help is also available to you. You can access this by dialing the number on the screen at the moment, or you can also click on GoToWebinar help, which is at the top of your webinar panel. And if, when you click on help and GoToWebinar help, you can, uh, you will be prompted to go to an internet browser where you will be able to troubleshoot your issue online. So if you do need anything else, please do contact me using the questions log and we can begin our presentation. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Ashley. It is my pleasure to introduce Rabbi Rich Kirshen. Rich has served as Hillel Director at Brown and Michigan. Yes. Right, Rich? Go Blue, yes. And is currently the director of the Salt International Education Center of the World Union. And in his capacity there, is doing programming internationally. Um, and both bringing groups to Israel and will be, Rich and his team will be leading the Israel Kalah, which begins on April 29th, um, as well as other groups. He, he and his team travel throughout the world to bring Jewish learning to our communities. We were in Paris and Mississippi to give you an idea of where we have been. And we are lucky to have Sorry, Rich with us. For those of you who have noticed that we also do the same webinar at 8 o'clock at night, Rich will not be on with us tonight. I will be filling in using his text and a lot of his information. So this is how we're trying to do it with Israel. So without further ado, we turn to Nanam Nachman Bialik, and we begin with the bracha. Please join with us. Baruch Ata Adonai, Elohim Elach Haolam, Asher Kitshanu B'Mitzvotav, Vitzivanu La'asok B'Jirei Torah. Rich, you're up. Okay. Um, I've never done this before, so be kind, because not getting the feedback is a little difficult. By the way, just to give you an understanding, I'm looking at my office window at the walls of the old city as the sun is setting on Jerusalem. I want to give you a little background. Uh, it's, it's a bit of tongue-in-cheek calling this uh, lesson Na Na Nachman Bialik. If any of you, if any of you have been in Israel or uh, are familiar with this phrase Na Na Nachman, is usually reserved for na na nachman mi'uman, okay? It is based on the idea of Nachman of Bratslav, uh, who is buried in Uman, and is a very famous uh, Hasidic rabbi. He was the grandson of, son of the Baal Shem Tov, the founder of Hasidut, and kind of became, a, uh, this whole idea of Nachman of Bratslav became somewhat cultish, if you will, and everybody who's running around Israel talking about Nachman of Bratislav, reaching out, and they're gaining more and more members. And, and this is our graffiti in Israel. All over Israel you saw the sign that said, Na Na Nachman Me'uman. And it was a chant that if you said it, uh, it would bring good luck. And if you notice, every year, thousands upon thousands of people on Rosh Hashanah, between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur go to Ukraine and visit the grave of Nachman of Bratislav and, and say these words, and uh, hopefully things will be good in their life. Uh, so a little bit of this is a polemic, because I once saw someone walking by with a t-shirt that said, Na Na Nachman Bialik. 
and uh, that is about the poet Chaim Nachman Bialik. And a little bit this lesson today, uh, we're going to look at the tension between tradition and change. Okay, um, uh, this is something as Reform Jews, uh, something as Zionists, uh, that we're dealing with all the time. In other words, uh, what was seen as old and what is seen as new. I just finished a full day taking my son on a class trip, and we walked in the footsteps of a young boy named Elisha Ben David, who was, uh, who was killed when he was 12 years old. He was a runner for the Haganah, and Israeli school children walk in his footsteps before Memorial Day, which is coming up uh, for us this, this next week. And I was walking through many, many neighborhoods that used to be, I guess, Zionist neighborhoods that are now Hasidic neighborhoods. Uh, so I was thinking a lot about the tension between, if you, if you will, uh, the old yeshuv or the old traditional society and the Zionist revolution. And that's really where you find uh, Chaim Nachman Bialik. And so this is a, an introduction to his poetry by Ruth Nevo. Uh, she writes the following, that there is nothing as whole as a cleft heart, an axiom attributed to the Hasidic rabbi Menachem Mendel of Kutsk. Um, so even talking about Nach Chaim Nachman Bialik, it's, it's going to his Hasidic and traditional roots, but this whole idea of self-division uh, Bialik, I think we can go to the next page. Joan? Should be there. Okay, okay, so Chaim Nachman Bialik is known as the Poet Laureate, okay, uh, of, the, of, of Israel, uh, really one of the first great poets of modern Hebrew. Remember, Hebrew as a very old language has words for sorrow, and on another level has no, had no word for shoelaces, okay? And the genius of Chaim Nachman Bialik was to take the language and, and take poetry that would speak it in a modern way. Uh, he grew up, uh, turn to the next uh, page. Sorry about that. Okay, so he grew up in, in a very traditional life. It reflects very much about the people who moved to Israel. Um, he came from a lot of poverty, a pious family. Uh, his father was not able to, what my father would say, machaleben in Yiddish. He was not really able to make a living. Uh, he died. His mother was penniless. Uh, a lot of these memories are very much deep into Bialik's poetry. Uh, he talks about when his, after his father died and his mother just couldn't scrape together enough uh, money, she could either get candles or bread. And he used to talk about her tears falling into the bread, and that's what he, you know, he was eating her tears. Um, but it finally got so, so this, the situation became so desperate, his, he ended, his mother ended up taking him to his grandfather because she just couldn't take care of all the children when he was six years old. And he was raised from the age of six by his very traditional grandfather, um, and really kind of brought up with Talmud. At the age of 15, he entered what was called the Yeshiva of Velochen, which was considered the Harvard of Yeshivas. Uh, he was a wunderkid. He, was in, he had a photographic memory, and so here you have Bialik coming from this very difficult background, this very sensitive child. At the age of six, he goes to this pretty stern but somewhat loving grandfather we know, and really kind of, you know, uh, stroked, if you will, and with Talmud. You know, that's what the way his grandfather showed his affection. And finally, Bialik, at the age of 15, goes to Volochen with the hope of two things. One, becoming a Talmid, a Talmid Chacham, which means a Talmud scholar. And that word is very important because Talmid Chacham is, is two things. One is, even someone who is incredibly learned in Talmud is always a Talmid, which is the word for student. In other words, you never stop being a student. And he was hoping to gain access to the Enlightenment. Okay, when Bialik is coming of age, uh, there's talk about reaching out into the dominant culture outside of the Jewish ghetto. And this is, is really compelling to Bialik, and he's trying to balance it. Next page.
Do we have any questions? Because it's a little hard without feedback. Not okay. yet. Not yet. Great. We're good. OK. So this period of life is really uh, the tension between, and by the way, it's the tension that uh, affected uh, the Jewish tradition. And it's, it's Reformed Judaism and Zionism. Once we break out of the ghetto, once there is a modernity and there's a collision with modernity, if you will, um, not only on a national level, but people on personal levels are trying to figure out how do you balance traditional faith? How do you balance the traditional halakha with all of these new ideas that, were co that are coming into play that are very compelling uh, to young Jewish people? And it says between faith and agnosticism, that's really what Bialik was wrestling with. How was he able to look at the Talmud? And, and by the way, he went back and forth. For a while, he said he was going to only keep Jewish law and study Talmud. And uh, this went back and forth for a while until it was too much, and he left the yeshiva. Uh, next page. But a little bit to get back to my original uh, comments, this struggle between life inside the ghetto and breaking down the walls of the ghetto and figuring out how to navigate the broad uh, open culture as a Jew uh, is something we've been wrestling for 200 years and continue to wrestle with. And I think my uh, hike with my child today uh, was amazing because we were walking on a hike that was talking about the Zionist revolution, the charge towards sovereignty, which is a very modern concept. And we're walking through a neighborhood filled with ultra-Orthodox Jews who had a very, and still have a very opposite reaction to modernity. And their reaction is, we're putting up the walls of the ghetto. We're speaking Yiddish. We're not speaking modern Hebrew. And there were hundreds of little kids running around us today speaking fluent Yiddish, looking like they could have lived in Poland uh, before World War II. And so we, the Jewish people, are not done with that struggle between the old and the new. And Chaim Nachman Bialik is, is one of the people who came of age and really set it down in poetry, that tension. Um, he really, you know, he, he writes in beautiful Hebrew, but it's also very important to know that Chaim Nachman Bialik wrote in European Hebrew. And as you know, in Israel, ultimately, it became Sephardic pronunciation. And when you read his Hebrew, if you read it uh, with the Ashkenazi pronunciation, it makes more sense. Um, but like many people, even though Bialik dreamed of going to Israel, it sometimes takes us, and myself included, there's never a good time to move to Israel. And so he really didn't get to Israel till he was 50. Um, he spent most of his time in Odessa, which uh, two books you should read if you want to know about this period of the Hebrew Enlightenment or the Haskalah. Uh, one is a book by, um, now I'm blanking on his name, Zipperstein, uh, who wrote a book about, if you've ever heard, and this is an important uh, figure in Chaim Nachman Bialik's life, uh, Achad Ha'am. There's a book by Stephen Zipperstein called Elusive Prophet by Achad Ha'am, who is really one of you know, the fathers of cultural Zionism. The, this whole idea that um, Zionism is not only about getting land and getting a state, but ultimately when you build a Jewish state, what's going to be the Jewish culture in it? And Chaim Nachman Bialik really revered Achad Ha'am, and all of this took place in Odessa. So the other book by Stephen Zipperstein you might want to look at is called The Jews of Odessa, because Odessa was just an absolutely fascinating place and a part of Russia where all the intellectuals uh, happened. All the, the intellectuals were located, and that's where Bialik lived for 20 years. He finally got to Israel when he was 50 in 1924. Um, he sold a lot of what you read about Bialik is, like many poets, constant, in constant poverty, uh, trying to make a living. Uh, he sold uh, four volumes of his poetry, which really uh, helped him. And he ended up buying a house in Tel Aviv. Joan and the Israel Kala will be visiting Chaim Nachman Bialik's house. And then became a figure 
uh, in what was called then the new yeshuv. Okay, this is the pre-state, the Jewish community pre-state. Okay, to the next uh, death. Are you getting to the next aisle? Thank you. Okay. Okay. She, uh, Ruth Neville here talks about this whole idea of it's remarkable how many of Bialik's poems take their rise, even at the level of syntax or diction from a negation, an absence, an emptiness, or deprivation. One of the things that, I mean, this is up for, for grabs. When Bialik's poetry first came out, it was very much looked at as reflecting uh, the voice of the nation. And some of that was true and some of that was projection. But it's also talking about his, his own personal life. And we see here, you know, in a world whose God is dead. Uh, and two things are happening. Uh, Bialik had a very difficult time with his father. He lost his father early on. Uh, this whole idea of, of this cosmic orphanhood is, in fact, his own orphanhood. Uh, but on another level, what is happening to so many young Jews at this time is a, la a, a loss of belief and a lack of a belief in, in the people who taught them. So, so many of the Zionists and so many of the revolutionaries like Ber Borachov, like um, Chernikovsky, and all of these uh, Zionists and cultural Zionists and poets make a, you know, Zionism was a revolution, make a huge revolution against their parents and say, this yeshiva world, this Talmud, this Yiddish, this lack of ability to control our own political destiny is old, is worthless, and we're going to change it and, and make something new, uh, which is the revolution of Zionism. And of course, you know, 60 years later, on some level, when you have people running around saying, na na nachman milman, in an essence, a counter-revolution by the ultra-Orthodox. So the old, you know, the new world uh, making a revolution and then the old world making a counter-revolution. And by the way, that's the tension going on in Jerusalem. I'm walking around today, but if you knew about our last uh, race for mayor, uh, the fact that we elected a Zionist mayor was a big deal in Jerusalem. And the only reason he really was able to win was he got support from a Hasidic group that was in a fight with another Hasidic group. So, you know, the controversies of, the controversies of, of Biotic's world of this old and new are, are still with us. Let's go to the next page. Before we go to the next page, and sure. I'm not sure what exactly which, whether Peter Shapiro is asking who published the books, and I'm not sure whether he is talking about Bialik's books or the two books by Zipperstein. OK, two things. Uh, the books by Zipperstein is, um, OK, that, that's from, uh, it's published by University of California Press. Um, and if you just Google uh, Stephen Zipperstein, you can find these two books that are really good. Uh, the other piece is that Bialik did a bunch of entrepreneurial things. Uh, the first thing I, I should mention is he and his partner, uh, Rivnitsky, came together and realized that, you know, there are all these young people who are going out into modern society who don't have yeshiva education, and of course, you know, one of his masterpieces piece was called Sefer HaAgadah, or the Book of Legends. That's something, if, if you can get a hold of, it's not that hard. It's, it's in bookstores, uh, Jewish bookstores, which really what he did is he took every Agadah, every great story from the Talmud, from the Midrash, and they put it together and they organized it absolutely beautifully. And that was out of concern that as society was changing, people weren't going to be able to access these stories that were, you know, kind of treasures in the Talmud. So Sefer HaGadah is one very famous book by Bialik. Uh, the other piece that he did is he started Dvir Publishing. Um, so he had a few publishing ventures, but I think Dvir was, was something that made it. And the other, you know, to give you a little background, more, more background of his life is he spent most of his time in, in, in Odessa. Uh, he spent quite a few years in Warsaw. He also gained pretty quickly uh, a reputation of being Chaim Nachman Biotic, the poet. Um, he traveled quite a bit and gave quite a few lectures. Uh, he suffered terribly in America. Uh, he didn't speak English very well. He felt that the Americans didn't get him. Um, 
But this was really what he did quite a bit before he ultimately made Aliyah and, and moved to, to Tel Aviv. And just to add on to what Rich was saying about Sefer HaGadah, it is available in translation in a one volume. Um, I'm still call, I think it's called the Book of Legends in English. don't have my copy. It's today. called the Book of Legends, Sefer HaGadah, Legends from the Talmud and the Midrash, and it's Chaim Nachman Bialik and Yehoshua Chana Ravnitsky, and it was translated by, actually a Reform rabbi, it was translated by William G. Browdy. Um, it's an amazing book. And great for those of you who like to do Debray Torah and find some text to use that's different, it's a great source. Any you know, other one of the things. Well, want to send us? Go ahead, Rich. Okay. Let's go to the next, because I want to get to the poem. We go to the next page? It should be there. Okay. okay, so this is... I picked this poem because I really think that it, I think it talks about uh, this is Chaim Nachman Bialik's struggle. Um, you know, this wrestling match with God, with tradition, and with change, with modernity, with what was left in Europe and what he sees as the future in Israel. Um, and what I also like about Bionic is uh, that he was not one way or the other. Um, he was traditional, which is also nice to, to see in this, in this city. It feels like, you know, you're, you're nothing or you're everything. And of course, Reform Judaism is, I think, one of the contributions we make in Israel. You don't have to be all or nothing. In fact, uh, there, there's a middle uh, moderate path. And Bialik was actually uh, chose that path. He would go to synagogue, um, but there were a lot of things that he did that were not particularly traditional. And so this this poem, should an angel ask, uh, really is about his own wrestling with with tradition, uh, with the new world that he's going to, with what he left behind. On some level, it probably reflects my own wrestling with this. And uh, you know, if you say there's nothing more hole in a cleft heart uh, for anybody who has is an immigrant uh, on some levels you're never comfortable <laughs> in Israel I'm American in America I feel on some level Israeli uh, and I've given that gift to my children as well but I think living in a society uh, of immigrants certainly Bialik is, is, is talking about this so here we go it says child where is your soul talking about himself, look for an angel, wander through the world. You'll find a peaceful village, forest walled, caped by an azure heaven's wide expanse, and in the midst one single lonely cloud. There, summer afternoons, a child would play, a solitary, gentle, dreaming child few things going on here. Bialik is really talking about his childhood from before he was six years old and forced to move uh, by his father. His father, by the way, opened up a tavern when they moved and it was a terrible life for them and everything changed. But Bialik always remembers his first year, six years as kind of dreamlike. On another level, on a national level, kind of this uh, nostalgia for the shtetl, right? Before the walls of the ghetto were, were broken down and, and things were much clearer, you know, this, this worked. Once upon a time, this was able to work. So you could take it from his personal uh, biography, which is important to understand, but you could also take it as, uh, you know, as there's a great line in Ecclesiastes which says, Yosef Dat, Yosef Machov. On some level, more knowledge, more pain. And then he goes on, he says, angel, I was that child. And once, when silence draped upon the drowsy world and drew the child's eyes up towards the sky, towards that single being, pure, distinct, then, like a dove that from its dove coat flies, his soul went after the enchanting cloud. 
And the question is, what's the enchanting cloud? Is the enchanting cloud the broader society? Is it the Russian li literature he studied when he got to Odessa? Is it the German literature he studied? Is it all of this that was outside the walls of, of Yiddish, of Jewish law, etc.? Onward. Okay. Did it melt away? You know, what are we talking about? Did did the shtetl melt away? Did that kind of dreamlike existence uh, that can't be maintained anymore uh, drift away? I'm going to just do one. Uh, a segue, not segue, um, tangent. This reminds me a little bit of uh, a number of weeks ago, I decided to go in disguise, not total disguise, but I wore black pants and a white shirt and a kippah. And I went to what's called the Great Bells Center. If you ever heard of the Hasidim, known as the Bells Hasidim, their story is most of them were killed in the Holocaust. A uh, few got to Tel Aviv and then on to Jerusalem. In Belz, the Belzer Hasidim had a synagogue that was able to seat 5,000 people. It was destroyed by the Nazis. They tried to blow it up. They could not. And they ended up making the Jews take it apart brick by brick by slave labor. The Belz Hasidim have been in Israel for, since the state, after the Holocaust. And what happened is they, they managed to raise enough money and they rebuilt the synagogue that was destroyed in Belz, except now it can see, sit 10,000 people. But by the way, on your way to Jerusalem, if you see a very big white building, you don't know what it is, that will be the Bell Center. And I went to the Bell Center because my grandparents were connected with Bell's Hasidim. I wanted to see. And it was absolutely amazing. Thousands of people. By the way, I have to, I have to say, I went as a man. I, I did not see a, a hint of a woman. They were somewhere up in the balcony behind, I don't know what kind of bars. Hundreds of young boys running around screaming Yiddish. And I said to myself, my God, you know, they, they rebuilt everything that was lost in Bell's. Okay, this is talking about reconstructing the old. It was absolutely fascinating. But as I was leaving, and I, I, I liked the davening, and you know, it connected to my family, but as I was leaving, what was the feeling also? There's only one problem. They built it on our backs, meaning those of us who serve in the army, those of us who pay taxes, why they don't serve in the army, and their children don't serve in the army. So they were kind of able to rebuild what was lost, but on a, some level, uh, it's not that easy, and it's not that clean. Um, anyway, this just remind me of this whole idea of old world, new world. Uh, so Bialik says, did it melt away? And he goes on, he says, there is a sun too in the world, my angel. My soul was saved by the mercy of its rays. A golden beam caught up my small white moth in whose bright light it glimmered a long while, mounted one morning on its golden shaft. Seeking a pearl of dew among the grass, it fell and foundered in an innocent tear, trembling that very instant on my cheek. Next page. Did it dry up? And I think he's, he's talking about this whole kind of innocence, this, if you will, spirituality. And then he goes to the next stage of his life, that is this idea of he goes to the yeshiva of Velochen. He says, no, it dropped onto a volume of Talmud, a creased, uneven parchment, talking about, in a negative way, the old staleness of Talmud, on some level, on which clung two long fine hairs from grandfather's white beard. Okay, so this is his grandfather who saves him with Talmud and stray threads from the fringes of his shawl, from his talus. 
caught in the drops of congealed candle wax. And this Gamara's maw, dead letters grave, my soul imprisoned, writhed convulsively. Okay, Rega. What happened? The first part of the poem is talking about this kind of Gan Eden, if you will, this heaven, and it's all wonderful. And then he sees something, and maybe he's alluding to the outside world, but he falls, and he's caught by his grandfather in Talmud, and he goes on to Volochin. But what's the problem there in Volochin is that his soul is imprisoned. It writhes convulsively. It's not satisfying for whatever it is going to fulfill Bialik. It says, was it stifled? Next page. It sang despite its writhing. In other words, the yeshiva of Volochin was okay. Angel of mine, and from dead letters, I love this, songs of life gushed forth, shocking the famous dead upon the shelves. This is Bialik talking about as a young man being in the yeshiva, but secretly at night writing modern Hebrew poems. And so what happened, what does he do with this tradition that does save him on a level? He takes it and recontextualizes it, and from dead letters, songs of life gushed forth. This, and it's a very Zionist thing. Looking at the Talmud, looking at its old creased pages, taking that uh, heritage and shocking the people before you and bringing new life. For they were different songs. This is his modern Hebrew poetry. Of small bright clouds, of golden beams of sun and shining tears, of damaged fringes and do drops of wax. But there was one song quite beyond its ken the song of youth and love. It drooped and sank. It languished, found no comfort or support. It pined away and wilted unto death. Could be the suffering, the sti being stifled uh, in the yeshiva. Okay. Any questions? Teaching without feedback is, is very strange. Why don't we wait a second to give people a chance to write comments or okay. send questions. And actually, I'll ask, you know, have people heard of Bialik before? I don't know. In, in Israel, by the way, this is, you must read Chaim Nachum Bialik. It's just part of, of uh, your education. Um, Janet is asking, in what year was this poem written? How old was he? It was, if I remember correctly, Rich, 1905, right? Yes. It's in, actually, he wrote it in uh, Warsaw. Doesn't necessarily mean, in other words, he's reflecting on his life, but... Um, But remember, all of this is going on. What's going on now? It's the first Aliyah. Uh, people are moving to Israel. It's very Zionist, socialist. Uh, but this is before the Turks are kicked out of Israel, right? So it's, it's very early on. Um, this is before uh, the Tsar is still in power. Um, this is after, you know, I really should mention this. This is after the Kishna pogroms. The famous Kishna pogroms were in 1903. Um, I'll talk about this, this, this song, it's a song, this poem. Uh, Bialik really uh, shot to fame after he wrote a poem called al Haliga, which means on the city of slaughter. In 1903, there were pogroms in Kishna. Uh, 50, 70 people were killed. Um, this is before what they knew what they could do with technology and mass murder and shock the world. And there were protests all over the world. And Bialik was sent to cover it because he was this, you know, important figure. And he went to cover it as a journalist. And what he wrote about it wasn't, oi vavoy lano, oi gewalt, what are they doing to us? He wrote a very intense poem that basically accused Jewish men of being cowards, of rather than die and defend their families, 
they hid in, you know, in bathrooms and pig pens and under the cellars, and they just watched. Uh, and this poem in such intense modern Hebrew had an impact on, in Europe, had an impact in Israel, and started was one of the reasons for one of the first self-defense organizations, Hashomer. So this is all very early on. But um, Bialik writes a lot of different poems. This is one about wrestling with identity and religious identity and old and new. Um, but that also, that poem on the city of slaughter really talks about does, do the old ways of being beaten and retreating to God and suffering and keeping the mitzvot, or is that really enough? And he, he gave it to the Jewish people, or more, more accurately, he really gave it to Jewish men. Um, this is the modern era. How are we going to behave? So if you ever look up the city of slaughter um, in 1904, 1903, I think it's called, I think it's, it's not called, the, um, I'm going to have to look that up before I get off. But two very intense poems about Kishnev. Okay, can we continue? Yeah, by my calculations, about 33. Since the second part of the question was, how old was he? Oh, okay. You know, I can figure it out, because he, he moved to Israel in yes. 1924. Yeah, okay. Any other questions? Okay, so why don't we continue? Okay. Ready for the next slide, Rich? Yeah. Whoops. We got another one before we do that. There appears to be no direct or indirect reference to something. Um, Peter, I'm not getting. He said God, uh, but I don't think we got oh. the whole question, Peter. seems to be no direct or indirect reference to God. Is that so? Yeah. You know, it's interesting. Uh, and I wonder if there's, there's an American cultural piece here, too. You know, Bialik will talk about the Shekhinah, you know, the divine presence. Um, he'll talk about uh, Angel here. Uh, he has other poems where he does. But no, as far as, and I see the next lines, he's really... I mean, it's it, on some level, it's it's just struggling with it, but no, not directly about. It's understood, but it's it's not it's not said specifically, either in the Hebrew or the English. By the way, that ma that he talks about, you know, this it's almost like you know this purse of like coins turned upside down. You know, the Talmud just doesn't hold on to anything anymore. Okay, are we on the next page? It's saying despite its record. We will be momentarily. Okay, sorry. Now we are. Ah. One day I opened that worn, faded book. At once my soul escaped and fled away, and still wanders roaming through the world. It seeks and strays and can find no relief. I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, that's, that's good for a poet, but I think it's good for for many of us who, who struggle with this. You know, and by the way, going back to that comment about Talmud Chacham, you know, I think this is a Kushner line. It's not where you go there, you, no matter where you go, there you are. It's a very Jewish thing, in fact, to say, no matter where you go, you're not there yet. Um, and even the word Ivrit, right, which is the Hebrew word, is Hebrew and the Hebrew language is Ivrit, and that means someone who, cr it's, Abraham was an Ivri, it was someone who crossed. Uh, we're constantly crossing back and forth between traditions, between cultures, between old, between new. Uh, Bialik crossed between Yiddish and Hebrew. He crossed from, you know, kind of uh, ultra-Orthodox Ukraine to Odessa. Um, and he seeks and strays, and he can find no relief. Uh, it's very much uh, appropriate for a poet, but it's, it's also appropriate, I, I think, for the Jew in the modern era. Um, we've been doing this, like I said, for 200 years, 
and that's probably not a lot in terms of thousands of years of Jewish history. Uh, but this whole kind of argument, and it, and it goes, by the way, to re, they're all rea we're all dealing or navigating reactions to modernity, and that's what he's doing. We reform conservative Orthodox, ultra-Orthodox, Zionist, however you want to find the label, uh, these are reactions to modernity. And he says, and there's no relief. And in the one of light of each moment, I'm sorry, each month's new, I think that says birth. It's cut off from my okay. page. When all convene to bless a lean, scant moon, which is referring to Kiddush Levana, okay, it flaps its wings and pi piteously weeps, clinging and clamoring at the fast shut gate of love for which it yearns and begs and prays. So now at this point, I would ask the question, what's he saying? Where is Bialik? I don't mean physically, but where... Where is Bialik in this poem? What does he want? What can he get? Give you a chance to write some comments. And also, how do you? I, I mean, how do you? How do we as Jews living in, I would say, modern or postmodern, uh, resonate with that? And what is this? You know, fast shut gate for love, which it yearns and prays and prays. What? I mean, he he's having a tough time here. Everybody, a chance. any comments. Rich? Yeah. A thought that, you know, I've been reading, I've read this numerous times since you've sent this to me, but suddenly the connection between Tishri and Rosh Kodesh mm -hmm. and the gate, mm. think of the gate shutting on Yom Kippur. Right. You know, how much <laughs> that is the connection? Month. Right, right. He has it every month, though, maybe. You know, it's like constantly, uh, you know, when all convene to bless a lean and scant moon, there, there's a tradition of blessing the moon. Right. And it's called Kiddush Levana. And I don't, also, I don't know where he's living, but if he's watching people, and you don't do it inside the synagogue, you go outside the synagogue. So I don't know if he's walking by seeing everybody, you know, in in their certainty. Listen, this is one thing I think that we, well, I'll speak for myself, that I share with Bialik, is he looks to people who are traditional, if you will, and what they have is they have certainty. I mean, they might be wrong, but at least they have certainty. And one of the things that happens in the modern era, certainly vis-a-vis -vis religion a lot, is this whole idea of uncertainty. And, and that's the really difficult struggle. He can find no relief, and, and maybe maybe the gate is shut. I'm just kind of riffing on this, is you know, of, of certainty. You know, he he wants maybe what he had as a, in, in childhood, or maybe what his grandfather had, which was probably more certainty. But he's now in a few worlds. You know, he's he's taking a bite of the apple. Any thoughts or comments, anybody? Is anybody on the line? Also, it may be important to say that today is Rosh Chodesh. Right, Chodesh. For the month of Iyar. Any final thought? Any thoughts? I will say one thing that Bialik said, you know, speaking in 
keeping in his tradition. He, he was very Hebrew-centric. And he said, you know, reading in translation is like kissing through a veil. Um, but that, that's what we have here. But that was, you know, his, his life's work was to, how do you bring Hebrew to become a live, rich language? And, and how do you take it out of just the, the you know, creased pages of the Talmud? And, uh, and by the way, you know, when you look at Israeli school children, you look what's going on here, and, you know, everyday life in Hebrew, uh, not only Eliezer ben Yehuda, but a number of, of modern Hebrew poets like Chernikovsky. By the way, there's another book that you should try to get a hold of. It's called The Penguin Book of Hebrew Verse. It's by T. Carmi. And really gives you, you know, from Yehuda, Amich, from Yehuda Alevi to Yehuda Amichai. Um, and it shows you the um, consistency from, you know, biblical poetry to medieval poetry uh, to, uh, to modern poetry. Um, and obviously, Bialik is, is the first when you get to modern poetry, you know, and then getting to people uh, later on. Uh, here's another comment. Okay. This from Janet. This sounds like it's been written by an old person looking back and reflecting on his life with regret. Yet you see on um, why the melancholy. I think I think that's true. I mean, I don't know regret because he's he's still not done with it. But I, I think it's it's definitely some yeah it's uh, it's frust it's frustra it, there's a frustration there. But he's not that old when he writes it. By the way, just to finish Bialik's life, he comes to uh, Tel Aviv. He buys this big house. Um, everybody wants a piece of Bialik, and he's absolutely exhausted. Um, he becomes part of the faculty of Hebrew University. Um, he's very active in the cultural life of the Yeshuv. Uh, he does travel quite a bit to uh, promote the pre Jew, pre-state Jewish community. Um, he never has children, by the way. Um, he, he is married to a woman named Ma Manya. Um, and in fact, one of his, almost like an adopted son, a uh, very fam famous member of Knesset, Rova Eliav, uh, kind of becomes his, his adopted son in a way. Uh, and Bialik uh, eventually has terrible terrible problems with his gallbladder. He goes to Vienna uh, for an operation. Uh, it doesn't go so well. Um, he dies of a heart attack. Uh, he's brought back from Vienna. Uh, thousands upon thousands. He dies when he's about 64. Thousands and thousands of people um, come out for his uh, funeral. Uh, his home is donated to uh, Tel Aviv as a cultural place, and it's still a, cult it's a cultural center. Um, and so, you know, he, he lived the last 10, 14 years of his life uh, in Israel. And Achad Am also, who was his mentor, uh, got to Israel as well. So a lot of these guys who were doing the work uh, for, about Hebrew literature, about the uh, Hebrew enlighten, enlightenment, are doing this in Europe. And uh, then they get to kind of near, past their twilight years, they, they get to uh, Israel. Uh, there's one poem maybe I'll leave you with, that every Israeli kid knows, child knows, uh, and it's, it's connected to this poem. It says... Rich, before you go there... Sure. Yeah. Because we had another comment. Okay. Um, he seems to... And Peter, you'll correct me if I read this incorrectly. He seems to have had certainty during his life, but as he grew, that certainty faded away which may have disillusioned him, was Peter's comment. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, I mean, he obviously also, you know, like a good manic depressive poet. I mean, he probably went up and he probably went down. But yeah, uh, the interesting thing, though, is, is in terms of certainty or, or uncertainty is uh, he wasn't into attacking others. He was pretty moderate. In other words, 
For example, Eliezer ben Yehuda only spoke Hebrew from the time he got off the boat until the time he died. Um, he was a fanatic. Uh, Bialik wasn't like that. In fact, Bialik um, spoke, even though his Hebrew was, was extraordinary, spoke Yiddish because that was his mother tongue. And people used to sometimes yell at, in the pre-state days, if you spoke Yiddish, people would yell at you or, or punch you or hit you and say, speak Hebrew. Um, and Bialik was very much against this. Same thing with uh, religion. Uh, Bialik went to synagogue, um, but he wasn't ultra-Orthodox. Uh, he was somewhere in between. So, you know, by the way, this is a little bit of a reform message. Sometimes being in between is the hardest place to be. You know, you could be on one end of certainty, uh, it, it's nothing, or you could be on the other end, you know. It, it, it's, it's all. Uh, those of us who kind of navigate between uh, have a difficult time. I'll start to tell the poem, and if someone else has a comment, I'll, I'll stop. The song goes, Na'adnid, Na'adnid, Red ale ale ale, mi la mala mi la mata, la kani ani va ata, which means nadned is for the sound that a swing makes in Hebrew. Nadned it goes back and forth, and it says nadned nadned go up go down, and it says mi la mala who is above us, mi la mata who is below us, la ani just me. The Atta, you. Um, but there's a little bit of a kind of a sneaky reference to maybe there's no God. Mila Mala, Mila Mata. Who is above us and who is below us? Just you and me. Um, and that's, uh, I, I, I assume the ultra Orthodox don't sing that, but in every playground in Israel and in every Gan, uh, that Bialik poem is, uh, is sung. Uh, so there's a, you know, his loss of father, loss of God, his uncertainty, uh, which Ruth Neville said at the beginning, kind of this, uh, who said that um, God is not mentioned, uh, probably one of the themes in Bialik's life, you know, losing father, losing kind of God. Any last thoughts? You have the Hebrew of the poem it's for you to look at. I'm sort of zipping through here to get to going fast. <laughs> the end of our webinar. Let me just you say one, well, so just can one last say, statement? Yes, Because maybe please. this is kind of like an introduction to Bialik. What is so amazing is that, um, you know, I think sometimes, we, you know, I like Talmud, and I, and I like uh, traditional studies, too. But there is a whole wealth of this uh, period of time uh, from when the Hebrew Enlightenment starts, if you will, modern Hebrew, um, and of these people like Bialik, like Chernikovsky, like Echadaam, who are really building the foundations in, in terms of culturally uh, for the Jewish state, which is extraordinarily rich. Um, so if you have a chance, you know, I suggest you, you explore it further. And just also to give kavod, you know, respect to Bialik, um, what an amazing person is, uh, also to study his poems, uh, Bushmo, you know, in his name. So just as much as it's uh, great that people are writing graffiti, Nana Nachman Neuman, about some Hasidic rabbi who was around, uh, maybe I'll start writing around graffiti around Jerusalem, Nana Nachman Bialik. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. And if you want a chance to study poetry with Rich at another point, I'm sure we will be planning another Israel Kala for 2011, and we definitely look at the poetry of various authors while we're there. The next Torah Live webinar will be Tuesday, May 25th, and hopefully the sign-ups will be available tomorrow. Our teacher at that time will be Jonathan Krasner from Hebrew Union College. And I don't yet have his topic, but we will again do noon and 8 p.m. And registration is open for the Summer Learning Institute. Uh, 
Rabbi Krasner will be, Professor Krasner will be one of the teachers, and all the information is available online. Um, and any questions, you can write to me at jbarber at urj.org. Ashley, you want to cover the end of uh, well, I think I think that we've already used uh, up our time, but I, I don't think anybody has any questions. Um, but this, really, if you'd like to listen to our webinar again or tell someone about it, it will be posted on our archive page, and you can access that by going to urj.org slash webinars and then clicking on past webinars. And thank you very much, and have a good day. Goodbye. Right. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.